I am Karan Yar, and I am the former fleet commander of the Nadar sector. Yes, I am the namesake for the battle most Hadzai call Yar's folly. I, however, need to remind anyone reading this that this name for the battle is a post-war creation. At the time, it was simply referred to as the Battle of System 6636HU by our people and the Battle of Earth by the humans. I had little reason to believe what I did would result in anything but victory. I made a mistake. I can see that now, but I will not apologize for my fervor in attempting to avenge the deaths of the royal family and take the initiative for the Empire in the war we had found ourselves in. I, along with the rest of the fleet, received the news about their deaths a few hours after that abomination of words called the speech. It obviously stuck all of us hard. Everyone looked at them with reverence. They were our spiritual leaders, the soul of our species. There was not a Hadzai alive I can think of that would have refused a request from them. We believed that without them, we would no longer have any direction as a people. Now, they were gone. A new emperor would be crowned eventually. There were still distant male cousins that could be sat on the throne, but they would never be able to fill the position quite the same. In the hours after this news spread across the empire, the communications net was completely saturated with messages coming and going from everywhere. Nobody knew what exactly we were to do. To describe how the empire worked, I'll use human terms as they seem to be more widely understood now. Sadly, few would understand me anymore if I used Hadzai ones. Officially, the Empire was a unitary parliamentary semi-constitutional monarchy. However, in reality, the Empire was a totalitarian military dictatorship. The Emperor technically held ultimate power, but through centuries of slowly acquired tradition, that control was rarely exercised anymore, and he had delegated much of his power to his inferiors. That led to a series of other technicalities. To put it as simply as I can, with the emperor withholding the use of his power except on rare occasions, the tribes were supposed to be the leaders of the Hadzai Empire in the emperors. Stead, but the military hierarchy held de facto power. The tribes had been reduced to a rubber stamp. They were the voice of the empire, but the words spoken were the hierarchies. The closest government I've found that would be comparable is the government of the 20th century human nation called the Empire of Japan. Thus, with the military hierarchy practically obliterated and the royal family so thoroughly and ruthless slaughtered, the empire was most certainly leaderless. Both tribes the tribe of commoners and tribe of elites, had mostly survived humanity's assault intact thus far. However, as I said, so long as a single male member of the royal family or a member of the military hierarchy survived, no Hadzai could ever consider them our leaders. The problem was figuring out which members of the hierarchy were still alive and of them, who would have the authority and ability to lead our people? I'm sure this confusion was exactly what the humans were going for. Yes, I know what the human in the previous section of this little history book said. Being allowed to read what has been written so far was a requirement of my participation. But either he was lied to or just doesn't understand what he's talking about. The humans knew exactly what they were doing by murdering the royal family. With so much chaos and everything in disarray, the only thing I was sure of was the need to strike back. I felt that the longer we remained bickering amongst each other over technicalities in the law and what we should do next, the lower our chances of dealing with whatever the humans had planned next. The best way, in my view, to beat their next move was to strike them before they could make it. A preemptive attack of our own, if you will to shift the initiative to us, and I had a perfect idea of exactly where and what we should attack. From what I could tell from the verifiable barrage of messages we'd received, nobody above the rank of fleet commander had survived. Or if they had, they had not been heard from yet. So I decided to act. 
I put out a message into the swamp the net had become and hoped others would heed. It. I informed everyone that I was taking command of the fleet and ordered all remaining ships that could make the journey to the home system to do so with all possible speed as we would be attacking the human's birth world in three days. Three days sounds unrealistic, but I had no time to spare. The next human attack could happen at any moment. The plan was to gather all the ships I could, head to Earth, take out the Philadelphia Naval Yards and any UEE ships in orbit, and then orbitally bombard the Tomb of Cyrus. They ripped the heart out of our species so I'd destroy the resting place of their most revered leader, while also depriving them of their best shipyards. An eye for an eye. However, as soon as I sent my message out, Another message was put out by Fleet Commander Kin Baron of the Natara Sector. This one was directly in opposition to mine. It ordered the fleet to disregard me and to hold their positions until things could be sorted out. This started a back-and-forth debate. As it intensified, things on the net calmed down. It seemed everyone decided to wait and see who'd come out dominant. I argued what I've stated previously— that we needed to strike back and take the initiative from the humans. He argued that it was exactly what the humans were expecting, that they were hoping we'd throw caution to the wind and come charging at them blindly. I know that now. With the war behind us, it's easy to say that obviously Kinbaran was right. I, however, remind everyone that I am not a fortune teller, and according to the information I had at the time, my plan stood a perfectly reasonable chance of succeeding. More than reasonable, really. Estimates showed that in three days, we could have nearly two and a half sectors worth of ships ready to attack. With that many ships, any commander should have believed they would be able to overcome a single system's fleet, even a home system one. We even knew how many ships and of what kinds the UEE's home fleet had. We could beat them. I knew it. It was obvious. However, as I said, I will not apologize for my actions, but I will admit I wish I had waited just a day longer. Eventually, both me and Carberin realized the other could not be convinced. We left it up to everyone else. Whoever wanted to join whichever side could do so. With the hierarchy in its current state, neither of us yet technically had the legal authority to give orders to anyone outside of our respective fleets, yet so the decision would have to be left up to them. After three days passed, my force almost doubled to just under two sector fleets. The core was my own sector fleet, which was down to about 70% of its full strength, thanks to the surprise attack. The rest was made up of ships from every other sector fleet. Destroyers from Impbin, Dreadnoughts from Limprian, even some cruisers from Carberian's own fleet joined us. Obviously, due to the distance, most of the ships came from the Kensar sector fleet since the sector directly bordered Nadar. Any ships from sectors beyond that were only there because they had been away from their sector at the time I put out the call for whatever reason. I contemplated waiting an extra day, but decided to stick to my plan. Once time was up and the ships were ready, we set a course for Earth and left to extract revenge. When we arrived over Earth half a day later, we were met in orbit by nearly the entire UEE home fleet. I was stunned. I had expected some ships, but not nearly the entire fleet. How could they have possibly known we were coming? You can follow a ship while it warps by knowing its heading and the disruption of space-time it leaves behind for a while, but no human ship had seen us leave. Then it dawned on me. They're stealth ships, particularly the one that had destroyed the Hidek mine. It had never left, but had remained in the Nadar system watching us. If that was the case, then that also meant that human ships were faster than ours, almost mind-bogglingly so. When we'd left, our intelligence had indicated that the UEE home fleet was still largely at dock at Mars and Earth. For them to have seen us leave, gotten to Earth ahead of us, and for the fleet to have organized so quickly, they would have had to have arrived less than a couple hours after leaving. It had also meant that the UEE had known we'd come and kept their ships on high alert, ready to deploy on a moment's notice. 
I had expected the latter. They had clearly been preparing for war for a while, but never considered they could move so fast. I forced the shock of these revelations to the back of my mind. None of that mattered now. We still outnumbered them by a large margin, and if we acted quickly enough, we could accomplish our goals and leave before reinforcements showed up. I assigned a couple dreadnoughts with a few cruisers and a destroyer escort to attack the Philadelphia naval yards, while the rest of the fleet engaged the UE home fleet and pushed our way to position over the city of Cairo, where the tomb of Cyrus was located. When I gave the order, battle commenced. Human rail guns, which were more powerful than our ship's coil guns, were devastating in close combat and could easily punch holes in anything smaller than a dreadnought. To do so, however, they had to disable our shields. That meant using hordes of missiles, something the humans had plenty of, as our front line, composed of the Harbin, Metcar, and generous dreadnought groups, pushed into the UEE fleet. It was dazzling the amount of missiles that enveloped them. Our PDGs, the only chemically propelled ballistic weapon we employed by this time, were doing their best, but the sheer volume was overwhelming. I broke off several cruiser wings to try and flank the humans from below and divide their fire. The swarm slackened slightly, but not by much. It wasn't long before ships started to lose their shields and be torn apart by railgun fire from all sides. Two of our dreadnoughts had been flying too close together, and an innovative human captain powered his own dreadnought down their length perpendicular to them, and, with their shields gone, fired his spinal rail gun straight through both of them, hitting both reactors and destroying them. The humans weren't coming out unscathed, though. Four of our cruisers surrounded a human dreadnought, the ENS Bahar, and pummeled its shields with hordes of unguided torpedoes. Our ships were designed for very close quarters fighting, and so we had deemed the guidance system unnecessary. Once its shields were gone, a mass of coil gun rounds forced their way through its armor and into its reactor. Overall, the battle was tough, but we were making headway. The UEE ships, through some very sophisticated maneuvering, managed to stay in front of us and continued to try and stop our attack, but were very much on the back foot. Our ferocious fighting was becoming too much for them. Over at the naval yards, our task force had managed to take out the small number of UEE cruisers and frigates defending them and were now pounding the individual dock's protective shields. It took about an hour, but soon enough the main fleet was almost within bombardment range of Cairo, and the naval yards were nearing destruction. Our morale, despite the heavy losses we were suffering, started to soar, and captains began to prepare their coil guns for orbit to surface fire, despite the remains of the UEE home fleet still engaging them in desperate battle. It seemed our superior numbers were winning the day. In an instant— Everything changed. Warning, multiple warp signatures detected. Those words will forever haunt me. We were so close, and yet victory was ripped from our grasp. From above us, hundreds of ships of the human fifth fleet warped in, drove straight down, and like a spear, stabbed right through the heart of our formation. We were completely taken by surprise as dozens upon dozens of our ships lost their shields from a tsunami of missile fire and were subsequently riddled with railgun slugs, many shots finding their target of our reactors. To quote one UEE veteran's recollection of seeing this counterattack. Then the 5th Fleet appeared above the Hadzai Fleet and dove in on them like the cavalry charging to the attack. They clashed and within minutes, the Hadzai crumbled like a dry cookie. Within a very short span of time, what had been the makings of a great victory had been turned into an incredible defeat. It was quite clear that the fight was lost. Now it was our turn to be outnumbered and we were very quickly surrounded. The few dozen ships left continued to fight, but I knew it was no use and gave the order to retreat. I sat in my command chair and started to put my head into my hands in... Morning for our defeat when my navigator informed me that the warp drive wouldn't engage. I snapped back to attention and asked him why. 
When he couldn't give an answer, I then asked if the remnants of the fleet had managed to get away. I hoped that even if I couldn't follow them, at least they could get back and tell Kinbaran of what happened. I became enveloped by fear, surprise, and confusion when the fleet also could not seemingly engage their warp drives. Left with no other options, I must stress that point, I ordered our remaining ships to cease fire. Some since the war have tried to claim I gave this order as an act of cowardice. Though I was willing to die to avenge the Emperor, I did not consider it cowardice to surrender when continued fighting would not achieve anything to further that goal and would only lead to our deaths. Perhaps if we surrendered, they may keep us prisoners somewhere we could escape and maybe find some way to hinder their plans. It didn't happen, but I believed it was a possibility at the time. Our ships obliged my command, though I would find out shortly that many wanted to keep fighting and only obeyed my order because they believed I had some master plan to escape our predicament or turn the tables in our favor. How they thought I would accomplish such a feat when we were outnumbered more than ten to one and all of our ships were damaged in some way many heavily. So I do not know. I have spent the years since the war consulting with every expert on warfare that will speak with me, humans obviously included, to see if there was something, anything, I could have done differently at that point, both with the knowledge I have then and what I have now. The answer has always been a resounding no. To my relief, the humans returned the favor and ceased fire as well though censors showed they were still very much ready to blast us into pieces. A request for communication was pinged to us, and I answered it. Due to audio recordings by the humans, I can relay to you word for word how the discussion went. Gera has asked that I do so in the interest of a more complete record. It brings me great pain to relive the worst moment in my life, but I shall, while also relating to you how I felt, and what I thought at the time. Um, Fleet Commander Yar. A human male voice boomed through the bridge speakers. Your ships are in no shape to fight. I'm assuming your cessation of fire means you intend to surrender. Before he could continue, I interrupted him. Before I give my answer, could I have the honor of knowing the name of the man I am speaking to? His reply was very off-putting. I had always believed humans would speak very formally in such instances as this one, but his reply was so casual, vulgar, and sarcastic, it very much caught me off guard. Sure you can. My name's your daddy, and I'm the one who just spanked you for being a naughty boy. I could hear the laughter and snickers of his bridge crew on the other end. I was so confused by his answer that I could not reply, and when I didn't, he continued after the laughter had died off. Jokes aside, I am Admiral Daniel Wilters of the UEE 5th Fleet. As I said, I'm assuming you wish to surrender. If you don't, then I suggest you prepare to be annihilated. You have ten seconds before we open fire again. My bridge crew looked to me, but I could not look them in the eyes as I replied. My fleet is at your mercy, Admiral. He snorted, as if he was irritated. I know it is Commander Yar. That's not what I asked. I asked if you were surrendering. I realized what he had wanted me to do. He wanted me to actually say the words. I was in no mood for games, so I obliged him. Yes, I am surrendering myself and my fleet. We were talking via audio communication, so I could not see him, but I knew he had to be smiling as he spoke. Roger that, Commander. Power down your reactors, drop your shields, and prepare to be boarded. We are watching you intently. If you try anything, and I mean anything, my fleet will turn yours into twisted scrap metal. I turned to my CARMS officer and told them to relay the message. He wanted to protest, but didn't. Once the message had been relayed and followed, we waited in near silence. While our main reactor was off and the larger backups were as well, a small auxiliary one remained on to provide life support and critical systems like sensors and communications. Thanks to those sensors, we watched as one by one our ships powered down, except for six of them, two of which were some of our remaining dreadnoughts. I demanded an answer for why they weren't following orders. The reply was simple and one I guess I wasn't surprised by. 
for the Emperor. They surged forward and opened fire with whatever weapons they had left at anything they thought they could hit. They didn't last long. The UEE ships returned fire, and the mutineers just disappeared. Even from my position, the hail of missiles and railgun slugs could have blotted out the sun had they been closer together. Once they were gone, the UEE locked their weapons back on us but didn't try to ask why that had happened, once again showing that they didn't merely murder the royal family for intimidation, no matter what that honcho man claims. They knew it had been fervor and the desire for revenge that drove those ships to attack in a hopeless situation. The humans dispatched their large personnel shuttles and boarded our ships. Admiral Wilters came in person to formally accept my surrender. A few of my ship's crew tried to resist being taken, but were either subdued or, in the case of violent resistors, shot. Since the war, this has been portrayed as a war crime, as if that word even applies to such a minor thing anymore, by imperial fanatics. While I didn't appreciate it, I have to admit, it was justified self-defense. We'd have done the same thing. As my men were being loaded onto the shuttles, my bridge crew had been allowed to stay to operate what systems were needed while the evacuation was underway, under human supervision, of course, which included Admiral Wilters. Right before the evacuation was complete, strange readings started to come in from our remaining dreadnought. We quickly realized what they had done. With subtle use of thrusters, they had managed to drift close to a group of human cruisers and their dreadnought leader. Then they restarted their reactor, but had gone about it the wrong way, and it was now set to overload in less than a minute. Wilters didn't need to relay this to his men, as they could also tell, and had started to move out of the way. Before they could do so completely, the reactor went critical. The human dreadnought had been too slow and was largely caught in the blast, critically damaging it. The cruisers, however, were luckier and suffered only medium damage. Wilters demanded an answer from me, but I told him I had not told them to do such a thing, since, if I had, it would have been a fleet-wide act, not just one ship. He accepted the answer, but the evacuation of the ships was sped up, and before long, they were empty hulls floating in space. As I rode a shuttle to Earth, I asked Wilters why my ships were unable to escape using warp. He merely chuckled and didn't answer. He was a smart man and didn't want to risk the method getting out, even if our escape was improbable. If we had found this out back then, it very well could be changed the course of the war. I will openly admit my understanding of the following subject is pretty limited. I very well may have things completely wrong, even if I understand the overall effect. If you wish to understand it better, it is best to do your own research. I learned after the war that humans had discovered a naturally occurring particle they called Hartman particles. They interact with space-time in such a way that they could, in theory, disrupt it, if the concentration of them was great enough. They are usually so thinly concentrated that their interaction with space-time is practically unnoticeable. Due to this, they generally have no real effect on warp travel, which of course relies on essentially bending space-time around a vessel to allow it to bypass the normal mass and energy conundrum that restricts objects with mass to below the speed of light. As I said, however, in great enough concentration, they could disrupt space-time and so interfere with a warp drive's ability to bend space-time, thus rendering warp travel impossible. The humans had found a way to collect these particles in a special form of containment that allowed a vessel carrying them to still use warp travel. Since before the war, they had been collecting these particles and had enough of them to start using them if they so desired as a way to prevent warp travel within a certain area. After they'd been used, they could be recollected for future use and to re-enable warp travel in that area. It has been questioned how the wider galaxy had not discovered these particles sooner and how the humans had been able to hide their discovery and collection of them. I cannot speak for the former. 
Maybe it was because the galaxy didn't feel the need to find a way to restrict warp travel or believed doing so would be too damaging to the environment. I do not know. As for the latter, however, the answer is simple. They lied. They disguised shipments of Hartman particles by labeling them as and saying they were other things, shipments of minerals, other scientific materials, pig shit, whatever they deemed would be a good cover story. They stockpiled them for just the right moment, and when it was time, they distributed containers of Hartman particles to the ships of the home fleet. While we were pushing through their lines, they used their maneuvering to stay in front as a cover for pouring them out across the battlefield. It was like a bear trap for us to walk right into, and when we did, we would be snared and unable to escape. Of course, I knew none of this at the time. All I knew is that I had just led two-fifths of our remaining fleet into what was essentially an ambush, though one the humans had not intended to go as it did. They had expected us to make a swift counterattack, knew where it would come from, and what its target would be, but had underestimated how hard we would fight. The intervention of the Fifth Fleet had not been planned. They had expected the home fleet would be enough to win the day, and had hidden the remaining ships of the fleet behind Luna, Earth's moon, to then strike us in the back. The Fifth Fleet had been on exercises, and came to assist the home fleet when they received word of the attack, even though they hadn't been ordered to do so. Thus those ships were no longer needed and had diverted to deal with our ships attacking the naval yards. Our men fought to the bitter end and were destroyed completely. What I wish I had known before the battle, I'm glad I didn't know immediately after it. And what pained me after the war to learn was that in less than a day, the Fifth Fleet had been planned to be redeployed in preparation for the human offensive into Star Cluster 76 GF. Had I just waited one more day, it's unlikely they would have been able to arrive at Earth in time to prevent us from bombarding the Tomb of Cyrus. We had been so close. At least the defeat would have accomplished something. As I was saying, the transports were headed to Cairo, both to process us as prisoners of war, but also to give us a glimpse of the thing we had been aiming to destroy. The tomb of Cyrus was an amazing sight. I knew this even before the war, as I had done a bit of studying of major landmarks on Earth, and the tomb of Cyrus was most certainly a major landmark. It was a massive structure, built like ancient human castles. It towered above everything before it, and yet was constructed in such a way that it appeared that the planet itself had built it. Sand curved up its walls and laid piled on its battlements. It was meant to symbolize that the earth itself mourned his death and desired to protect his body. Considering the importance we would later find Cyrus, the first and only emperor of mankind, had for human history and their current state, it is fitting. As the sight of the tomb loomed in the window, I turned to Admiral Wilters and asked him how could humans have been so ready for and capable of making war when their last one had been waged by their great-grandparents. How could they be so warlike and yet so peaceful and forgiving to their alien acquaintances? He looked at me, and what he said next I will never be able to forget. We humans have a saying. It's an ancient one originating from a now practically extinct language, Sivis Pachem Parabellum. He turned to look at the tomb. If you want peace, prepare for war. I could only look at him in silence. The revelation that humanity hadn't just been preparing for war for a few months, but really had been doing so since their last one wasn't much use to me now. I would spend the remainder of the war as a prisoner in a camp on a planetoid the humans called Sedna. It was a dreadful place, and one of which I will not speak of. If there is a hell, it is that icy rock floating in the middle of nowhere. All that matters is that's where I would spend the forthcoming years along with so many other middle and high-ranking Hadzai personnel, far from the warmth of a star and practically unknown to the rest of the galaxy. If only I had waited one more day, 